Hey everyone, it's Mark with Couple of Firm, Florida Native Plant Society. Uh, I'm here today with Nia Wellendorf from Magnolia Chapter of Florida Native Plant Society, who will be discussing and presenting about Florida's aquatic, rare, and uncommon plants. I'm going to go through our announcements really quickly before I hand it over to Nia. Uh, we'll be happy to take some of your questions and comments live. Uh, matter of fact, I will queue them up so once Nia is done with her presentation, we can take them as they come along. So welcome, a uh, couple of ferns mission is the conservation, preservation and restoration of Florida native plants and native plant communities. And please subscribe to our YouTube channel in case you are wanting to revisit this presentation or several of our presentations from the past. You can find us at youtube.com slash couple of fern. Uh, I have the uh, channel pulled up right here. We are right now at about 125 videos and the subscribe button is in the right hand corner in this red box right over here. So please report your monthly hours. Uh, actually, I put this QR code in here. So in case you're viewing this on your screen, uh, pull out your phones members. Uh, take a quick picture of the QR code. It will route you to uh, the FNPS volunteer hours form. And a couple of our members are encouraged to report their hours on a monthly basis. Matter of fact, uh, if you are a member for a long time, you know that by the time I'm done with the, uh, these announcements, uh, you can report your hours uh, within 30 seconds. So your hours will be reported by the time I'm done with my announcements as well. Uh, the big event of this month is the native plant sale. It is outdoors, guys. So it's completely outdoors, uh, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Sanford Garden Club. This is 200 Fairmont Drive. Uh, we are expecting it to be well attended. This is the first plant sale of the fall season. Uh, we're really looking forward to meeting our members, uh, really looking forward to interacting with new potential members answering your native plan questions, um, and also uh, just promoting FNPS Florida Native Plant Society all around. So it's August 14th, this Saturday, 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can find further information on Facebook, and you can always email me at coupletfern at gmail.com for further information. Our next month's program is actually gonna be with the wonderful Brandon Corder, a young gentleman who is pursuing his PhD at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He'll be discussing Florida orchids. Uh, Brandon is actually a resident uh, or former resident uh, of Gainesville, Florida. So he is a Florida boy himself. Uh, September 13th, which is the second Monday of the month, it'll be virtual on Facebook and YouTube and it'll be free. 7 p.m. So hope to see you then. Same time, same place. So what is Couple of Fern? As many of you probably have uh, wondered, you've heard Couple of Fern through social media, Couple of Fern, Couple of Fern. Uh, is it a fern uh, organization? Is it part of the Native Plant Society? It is part of the Native Plant Society. We were named after a rather regionally uh, uncommon plant plant, uh, the beautiful couple of fern. So that's how our chapter got its name. But what are we? So we are gardening, education, consultations. These are some of our uh, core services. Uh, we do demonstration gardens across the region. Uh, if you are interested in education presentations, please contact us. Our email address is listed right here. Uh, we do a lot of virtual uh, programs and we are open to virtual opportunities at this time. Uh, and co uh, contact us in case you would like a consultation uh, for native plants in your yard. So in case you happen to be in the region, you're wondering what type of native plants will thrive based on your housing development. If it's in a rather uh, swampy area uh, where the soil remains rather wet or is it high and dry, we can rec recommend plants based on your needs. So a couple of firm members, who are they? So they are residents of the Central Florida and the North Orlando metropolitan area. Uh, this includes areas such as Altamont, Longwood, West Volusia, all of Seminole County, all of the major North Orlando metropolitan areas that bleed into Seminole County and West Volusia. That's our direct service region. 
or in case you happen to be an exclusive distant learner. We actually have a member that's out in Pennsylvania who is a true blue couple of fern head. We call our members couple of fern heads. Uh, so in case you happen to be one of those people that are exclusively distant learners, they're just fans of what we do and they're supporting us outside of state, please, uh, we encourage you to become a couple of fern member. Membership is your ultimate show of love and support. However, if you are in Florida, please do select a chapter local to you that you wish to contribute locally. So come grow with us, see native plants like never before. What, it, what do we do? Simply support us, events, workshops, community gardening, field trips, virtual learning, internships. Uh, we have a very robust internship program now, uh, environmental study areas, plant sales. So these are just the, gist of what we do and so much more and the best way to do that is to become a florida native plant society member refer someone to us today go to fnps.org click join or find where the membership tab is and then you can select couple of fern i actually have pulled it up right here so this is the form and you would just choose couple of fern and then you would complete the form from there so it's simple as that and student, individual, household, and business level memberships are available. So please choose something that is pertinent to you. And tonight, with further ado, it is rare and uncommon Florida aquatic plants with Nia Wellendorf. Uh, we are honored to have this Magnolia chapter member with us today. Uh, Nia, if you would, please uh, introduce yourself to uh, your audience. All right, thank you, Mark. and. Um, I, I really appreciate Mark inviting me and uh, appreciate your uh, attention, uh, whoever is viewing. So um, my name is Nia Wellendorf. As Mark said, I'm, a, I'm also a, a Florida Native Plant Society member and I've been um, active with my local chapter for almost 20 years, the whole time I've been um, here in Florida. Um, that is in Tallahassee, so we're the Magnolia chapter. Um, so in Tallahassee, I work for the Department of Environmental Protection. So I am a, a native plant person. I'm also a water quality person, and that really makes me um, an aquatic plant person. So I, I uh, uh, love aquatic plants, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to share with you. Perfect. Let's get your presentation up and running, Nina. <laughs> okay. There we go. All right. So um, one thing I I also am a mom, and so um, I have had a chance um, at, at my work. I I do um, I have had the opportunity to see a lot of aquatic plants work on um, lake uh, plant sampling for many years. But I also uh, enjoy it in my free time. And um, these are, uh, this is uh, one photo of some Force Family Fun. So um, I first got, um, I guess I first got interested in aquatic plants when I was doing my master's degree at the University of Alabama um, in Tuscaloosa. And I had an aquatic plant class there and my professor was great and real knowledgeable. And, and then uh, when I came to Florida, um, got right to work on it. So here's the rest of, uh, of the cohort, just so they don't feel, feel left out, um, the other half of my family. So this photo um, is on the left. You can see an aquatic plant that is not at all uncommon, <laughs> um, a very common uh, pickerel weed, which I'm sure you're familiar with, um, but really beautiful plant. So before I, I launch in, um, Mark asked me to talk about rare aquatic plants. And I think he's specifically interested in a couple that are state threatened um, and tracked by FNA, the Florida Natural Areas Inventory. Um, but first, just a word, a few words about aquatic plants in general. Um, so as in just about any ecosystem, plants are a key component of aquatic systems. Uh, they're really important for all of the different ecosystem services they provide, whether that's food or habitat, shade, nutrient cycling. Um, they're also great ecological indicators. So 
Um, just like in uplands, while some plants are generalists, um, others are only found in certain kinds of waters. So there's um, some kinds of plants that are only found in soft waters or hard waters, um, low nutrient waters or high nutrient waters, um, different you know, preferences for substrates, whether it's sandy or organic. So we can learn a lot about um, a, a, a water body just by seeing what plants are there. Also, of course, some things are gonna grow in flowing waters versus still waters. So um, what I think is interesting is that aquatic ecosystems tend to be a little less well-known, um, even by really good botanists, just because sometimes you do have to get out there on the water um, in a boat or a kayak or something, and, and um, people just don't spend as much time out there. Um, but I, one of my goals is always to make them seem a little less daunting. Um, I guess one other quick note, just, um, you know, the, the plants that are growing on the edges of water bodies or even in the shallow areas, the littoral zones, um, they really are very important for capturing anything that runs off the land, whether that's sediment, um, nutrients, what have you. So lots of, lots of, good, lots of good reasons to um, take an interest in what's there and paying attention to whether or not our, um, the species that should be there are, are still there. So uh, before getting into anything rare, I'll cover um, a few common ones. We'll start with some lily pads and um, point out some favorites. So I'm sure everybody knows this, this white flower plant. This is the fragrant white water lily, Nymphaea odorata. And the, um, I don't know, you might be able to see my pointer, the large uh, leaves are of Nymphaea. So if you're not familiar with how to tell lily pads apart, it's important to see where the stem comes up on the leaf. So on Nymphaea, the stem comes up in the center and there's a, there's a rip in the leaf or a break in the leaf. So it's uh, not a, a complete circle or oval. There's a break in the leaf and then there's a right angle. So um, those large leaves are the, the leaves of the Nymphaea odorata, the white water lily, which is pretty common and I'm sure you've all seen it. Um, but this smaller floating plant is, um, is not quite as common and um, it's one of my favorites and I was pleased Mark used it in uh, the advertisement. So that plant is called Brasinia shrebberi. So I will warn you, um, um, I, I like to stick with the scientific names, but I have included the common names uh, for folks as well. But this one is known as water shield or snot bonnet. We like to call it snot bonnet because it has these really slimy, um, this, this really thick slime on its stems and the undersides of the leaves. So that is a um, very clear uh, identifying characteristic, but it has smaller floating leaves. And you can see that the stem is attached in the center, but there's no notch. Um, there's no break in the leaf. So um, that is uh, um, uh, one, one way you can also tell it. So Someone I know here locally, you know, in talking about lily pads, there's lily pads, there's big pads, little pads, and then bonnets. So these are the bonnets, um, football shaped. And then they have this super sweet uh, red flower. So um, this is one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite little flowers. And, and these are pretty small. So if you're out and you see these, these small football plants, um, then, you know, do, do look for these little red flowers because they're, they're really sweet. Um, and these, these pads do get eaten. So a lot of different uh, lily pad type plants get, get eaten by insects and you can see the herbivory going on there. So that's the snot bonnet. Um, another one that isn't super common, but you definitely see it around. And I think if you don't know what it is or don't know that it's different, you might just think it's a small um, white water lily. Uh, but here on the right is one of those white water lily pads where you have this very clear right angle notch on the leaf. And then these on the left here, these smaller ones that are um, more rounded and uh, more like a heart shape, these are Nymphoides aquatica, they're floating hearts. And we actually do have several other species of Nymphoides and um, 
in your area, you have several exotic species actually, and they have a, a slightly, um, there's some differences. Um, the native one, Nymphoides aquatica, which is, which is common statewide, um, it's gonna have these white flowers and I'll show you a closer view of the flowers in a minute. Um, it has these little tubers underneath the plant. And um, so it's often called banana lily for that reason, because these little tubers kind of look like bananas. And then the underside of the leaf is very rough. So this red underside of this leaf is real rough. So these are our native floating hearts. And they usually are a lighter green color than the, um, the nymphaea, the, the water lily pads. And so this is what that flower looks like up close. Um, it, it's white flowers and some of the exotic ones will have fringes on them or they'll have yellow flowers. So um, if you have a fringe free white flower with these little banana tubers, um, these are our uh, Nymphoides aquatica floating hearts. Another really cool uh, pad, then these are pretty common as well. So I'm sure you've seen these are the American Lotus Nilumbo lutea. So these have a large peltate leaf. That peltate means that that stem comes up in the center. Um, also does not have a notch. Um, and this beautiful yellow flower. And then um, when the fruit forms, it looks like a shower head. So in this photo, it's green and fresh, but when they get older, they're, they're um, brown and dried and you know the sort of thing that one might put in a flower arrangement or something. Um, so they and they and they look like shower heads they're they're pretty fun so as i mentioned i i take my kids out on the water and and we're always i'm always looking for things to make them enjoy being out there in the muck and so uh they do think these shower heads are cool and the really cool thing about this plant is that the leaves are water resistant so um it's it's pretty fun you've got uh um, actually, this photo shows these these larger pads surrounding it are actually water lily pads, the the nymphaea pads, and so this middle one is the um, the lotus, the nilumbo, and uh, you can see the water repels. So it's it's pretty fun, uh, pretty fun plant. And as the last slide showed, they can stick out of the water or they can be floating, just depending on um, how they're growing and the water level. So those are some pretty cool, um, those are some pretty cool lily pad type plants that um, that you're probably familiar with, um, and uh, hopefully that gave you a little more, a little more information about them. Now people tend to be a little less confident when it comes to submersed plant identification, and I think this is partly because those plants are underwater, so you usually can't see them. Um, they can be slimy, and you know who knows what kind of bugs are in there, whatever, and they just kind of seem out of reach. So um, I've got to say these are my favorites, the submersed. So I'm going to um, show you how to identify some of those. So if you look at a photo like this, so this is an underwater photo. So I think you can see in this photo that um, while, you know, we do have kind of a tangle, um, there are some different colors and different shapes and different leaf arrangements that you can pick out. So in this photo, we definitely have at least four different taxa. So um, I'm going to go through uh, a few of these and, and kind of point out how you can identify them. And, and these are not those rare ones, but we'll go through a few of the more common submersed plants. And then I'll talk about some of the rare ones. So just to kind of demystify submersed aquatic plants, um, we uh, I like to think of them in, in different categories. So we have those that have a main stem and then have world leaves. So sometimes these world leaves, um, and that just means they're growing around the stem in a whorl, like they're not opposite or alternate. Um, so sometimes these world leaves have really are really dissected. Sometimes they're simple. Um, we also have um, some macroalgae that um, I'm not going to talk about tonight, but there are a couple of taxa that grow um, in our uh, lakes and streams that can look like uh, macrophytes or, or aquatic plants, but they're really macroalgae. Um, and, and they have some different characteristics. And then there are also some submersed that are more slender and don't have the world, um, those world leaves. 
And then of course our strap leaf. So I'm not going to be talking about any strap leaf tonight, but you guys are probably familiar with eelgrass or you've seen something called eelgrass. Now there are several <laughs> plants that have the common name of eelgrass, but, uh, but I won't be covering those tonight. So I'm going to start with a common submersed that is um, has a leaf pattern that's whorled and forked. So this is Ceratophyllum demersum or coontail. And so on the right side is kind of its typical color. It's usually like a bright green. Um, on the left side, though, you can see that it can vary. Um, this, this one, it's kind of orangey. Sometimes it can even look a little more brown or black, depending on the conditions it's growing in. So this one has a pretty distinct, um, has a, a, you know, on the left, you might think, oh, it looks like any old, you know, aquatic weed, whatever. It has a really distinct branching pattern. So it has this central stem and then it has these whorled leaves. And each of those whorls, each of the leaves is split like a, a tuning fork or, uh, or like a wishbone. So it has a real distinct wishbone shape to the leaf. And then each little leaf has um, little little teeth on it. Um, so that's a very distinct um, branching and, and leaf pattern that, that only this plant has. So this is, this is coontail. Um, and just some more information on the right here, this photo is kind of how it might look. Um, a lot of these submersed plants will uh, look like foxtails in, in the water. Um, but that's where when you look at the more closely at the branching, you can see that um, that, that they have that forked, uh, branch. And the other thing about coontail is that it holds its shape out of water. So some aquatic, some submersed aquatics will like get completely limp when you take them out of the water. This one holds its shape. And so that is something that helps with the identification. Um, so, um, We've kind of covered these. Now on flowers, I will say that for a lot of these submersed, and maybe this is also why they're not as well known, many of these submersed don't have showy flowers. Um, a lot of these plants, um, you know, produce seeds, but they don't necessarily rely on those seeds for, for spreading. A lot of them are clonal. Um, the, a lot of the flowers aren't, aren't obvious, so I don't know that I've ever noticed a, a flower on this ceratophyllum demersum plant. Another common one is Kabamba Caroliniana, which is called fanwort. And if you look at this branching pattern, and you can see it in the photo and in this drawing, um, the the leaves are opposite. So um, there there's just two leaves at any one spot on the stem across from each other, and they're shaped like a fan. So um, or palmately shaped, like a hand, like spread out. Um, so that's where it gets the name fanwort. And then it does have these little flowers. Um, and you can see in the photo on the right, um, this is a condition where there's just tons of this kabamba in the water. And there are all these little pink flowers up on the surface. And this one also has a little floating leaf. So on the left picture here, you can see this tiny floating leaf. Believe it or not, this plant is actually closely related to the snot bonnet I showed you, that football plant, Brazinia. Um, and uh, you wouldn't know it except they both have that little leaf. Um, so that is fanwort. And here's another uh, photo where it's pulled out of the water. And you can see that this one does not keep its shape quite as well out of the water. It does get kind of mushy and limp. Um, and color, color is a good way to also be able to identify this one. So um, Kabamba is usually pink purple colored. Sometimes it's more green. Um, but it often has some part of it that's uh, purplish or, or reddish. And then here's just another photo where it's looking a little more green under there, but you can still see these purpley stems and you can see these little floating leaves and then that, that flower that um, can be pink to white, although I think it's just kind of bleached out in this photo. And I will say this one can kind of get to... Uh, to um, uh, pr to be pretty abundant and it isn't everybody's favorite for that reason, but it is a native. So now we're going to move on to uh, another genus of submersed plants. And, and I'd say these are most, this is mostly submersed um, and I'll explain why. 
So um, shown here are a couple different species of milfoils. So these are in the genus Mariophyllum. And here you've got a branching pattern um, of leaves where they're whorled leaves, they're dissected, but they're pinnately branched. So um, they're, they're branched like a feather or a comb or something. Um, so very different from that fan shape and very different from the tuning fork split in, in those other species I just showed. So all the Mariophyllums have this um, shape of their leaf. Um, now, the one on the left here is the only non-native plant I'm going to show you tonight. So this is one that you may have seen. This is called parrot feather. It's Mariophyllum aquaticum. Um, and this one does have more uh, uh, vegetation above the surface of the water than the other species. For, uh, for the other four species we have, um, this part that sticks up above the water, like on the picture on the right, is actually just the fruiting structure. So those are not leaves. Um, that is the fruiting structure that sticks up above the water, but the leaves are all submersed. So uh, let's get into some of those species. So in Florida, we have five species of Mariophyllum or milfoils. Again, they all have that world pinnately branched leaf shape. Um, two of them are non-native. So the Mariophyllum aquaticum, which I just showed you that parrot feather. Um, the other exotic one is Mariophyllum spicatum, which um, does tend to grow more in flowing waters. Um, aquaticum can go either way. Um, but both of those non-native taxa have green stems and they're smooth. Um, and, and they just don't look the same as, as the native ones. The three native species we have pretty much always have reddish stems and, uh, and, and reddish leaves. And the stems tend to be more rough. They're not smooth. So again, texture is pretty important. So you got to touch all the slimy stuff to tell what it is. Um, but then there's some variation. There are three species, and I'm going to show you all three of them. Um, there's Mariophyllum, Heterophyllum, Laxum, and Pinnatum. And the, the way that you tell these species apart is that their fruiting tips have different bracts on them. Um, so I'll show you examples of those. Um, so they all stick up above the water surface, but they have different kinds of bracts. And then these leaves can have different numbers of, of uh, segments. And of course, all the segments overlap. So here, the leaves have, uh, like for one species, it's 12 to 28, and then 8 to 10, and 11 to 21. Well, there's some overlap there. <laughs> so these are kind of tough um, to tell apart, but... Um, but there are three native species, so we'll take a look at those. So on the left here is Mariophyllum heterophyllum, um, which I think is our most common one. This is a, this is a native Mariophyllum, and again, here's the flower stalk. And in this photo, you can clearly see the stamens. So, you know, these are not big showy flowers, but they still are, are flowering plants. And all these are, they look like leaves, but they're really the bracts that subtend those flowers. So for Mariophyllum heterophyllum, um, the bracts are typically whole and they um, have this uh, shape to them. On the right here, um, I'm, I'm pretty certain that this is Mariophyllum pinnatum. So um, it's interesting because the third native I'll tell you is, is actually the one that FNA tracks, but I have seen Mariophyllum pinnatum a lot less frequently than, than the others, but pinnatum here, um, it has that middle range number of segments on its leaves. So here's a leaf you can see. Um, again, we have this red underwater stem and you can kind of tell that it would be rough looking. See how these are kind of sticking up. Um, so they're kind of crunchy, but these bracts on the flowering structure are really divided. So those bracts are heavily divided and um, that is a characteristic of that species. And then the third native Mariophyllum we have has a totally different flowering structure. So this is Mariophyllum laxum, um, and this is called loose water milfoil. I've also seen Piedmont water milfoil. Um, and on this flowering structure, the bracts are super tiny. So these yellow things here are the stamens and the flowers themselves. You really can't even see the bracts. So, um, 
so as I go through this this presentation, I'll point out ones that like I get excited to see. So if I'm out sampling a, a lake, I, I do get excited to see this plant because I think these little flowering structures are just so dainty. Um, and this this Mariophyllum, um, the underwater uh, stems are also red, um, but I will say they don't tend to be quite as robust and crunchy, so to speak. So this is the um, these are just some some stems that have washed up um, at the shoreline. So um, these couple of photos are from a lake over in um, Liberty County in the National Forest, Camel Lake here. And uh, so this is Mariophyllum laxum, those red stems and um, and then with the tiny little fruiting structures. So this one, um, I don't know that it's listed as threatened or endangered, but it's tracked by FNA. Um, this is just another um, under an underwater photo I had of this species growing in um, another lake in the Panhandle, where um, underwater it doesn't it doesn't look very very red here, but you can see that you know it's got kind of this foxtail growth, and then there's um, some branching going on. Um, but here is that plant in hand, so um, it has those tiny flowering structures, um, and uh, and then. Uh, the reddish stem with, uh, you know, a little bit more um, delicate leaves. All right, so um, the other genus that includes a uh, tracked threatened plant um, is Nias. So um, I pronounce it Nias. Some people say Najas. Some people say Nahas. I, you know, these are Latin names, and so I'm sure you're all familiar with the the fact that you know anybody can pronounce them however they want. I say nias, um, and these are called uh, naiads or um, uh, those are another common name that I have that'll come come to me on another slide. But we have um, it, we have six species, uh, or rather five species of these in Florida, and the main um, identifying characteristic for nias. So obviously, um, this is just one of the species. It clearly doesn't have the same kind of world dissected leaves that those other submersed had. Um, this one has opposite leaves. So um, these leaves are, are opposite and they're simple. You know, there's no dissection to them. Um, they all do, you can see even on this species, it has a little bit of a reddish mid vein, but that's, it's not always uh, prominent. But the main thing is this species has um, submersed slender branches, um, these opposite leaves. It does a lot of branching um, and there are little teeth. So all the species of this genus have teeth. Some are more visible than others. So this one has small teeth. So um, the five species we have, I, I should have mentioned, I'll, I'll show it again, but that one was Nias guadalupensis, which is the most common. Um, and then we also have this Nias filifolia, which is a state threatened that I'll also show you. Nias minor. So minor is a uh, non-native and it's only, uh, I'd say it's possibly more uncommon. Um, it's only vouchered from two counties and I will explain um, how it, it can be a little tricky um, to, to tell from filifolia. And then there's Nias marina, um, which um, occurs in like saltier waters. So um, I'll show you a photo of, of that. Um, and the Nias radiana is, um, I have never seen this one. It's only occurs in four counties in South Florida. Um, and so I don't, I don't know that it's very common there because I haven't heard much about it either, um, but it's, it's down there. So these species can be distinguished by how wide their leaves are, um, how big did the teeth are and the shape of the fruit. So I'll show you some of those. So Nias guadalupensis, this is the common one. And if you have seen any of these, I, I'm, I'm sure you have probably seen this plant. Um, it has smursed, very long stems. They're slender, lots of branching. The leaves are opposite um, or sometimes in whorls and, and you can't always tell for sure, but they're definitely not alternate. Um, so if, if you are familiar with other aquatic plants, if you know Potomagetan, um, the pond weeds, so pond weeds, I'm, I'm not going to be showing tonight, but they have alternate leaves. So that is sometimes there are species that can look similar 
because sometimes they can have similar size leaves and um, but they have alternately arranged leaves so that's how you can always tell um so the leaves in nice guadalupensis are narrow but they're over a millimeter wide but they're narrow <laughs> um but you'll see they're they're wider than some of the others and they're about an inch long so this drawing up here i think is useful most most of these drawings um i, sh I should have mentioned some of the drawings are from the godfrey and wooten um, set of keys, the wetland plants of the southeastern United States, which is um, a fantastic reference. And some of them are from um, the IFAS uh, Center of, of Aquatic Plants. So um, Nice Guadalupensis does have small teeth on the edges, um, but as you can see in the photo, they're not real obvious with the naked eye. You can see them with a hand lens, um, and uh, you certainly can see them with magnifications. Uh, magnification. Again, I don't see flowers for this plant very often. It's not one of the um, identifying characteristics, but this is Nias guadalupensis, and here's a underwater photo of it growing in one of our springs. Um, and you guys probably recognize the other plant in the photo. So um, this is hydrilla, which I'm sure you've all seen, and it is not at all uncommon, but um, but again, you know, looking at these plants side by side, you can see hydrilla has this world set of leaves and Nias has these opposite leaves and they're a little longer and thinner. Um, so that is the Nias guadalupensis Southern Naiad. And this one isn't gonna have anything ever sticking up above the water. This is gonna be completely submersed. And this is that Nias marina, which is the one I said grows in, um, higher conductivity waters. May, I, I don't know if it grows in brackish waters, but definitely a higher salt content, fresh water. Um, I'm not completely sure. This one's called spiny water nymph. Um, and here I need to tell you that in, um, I, I've never seen this plant in the field. Um, I've only seen it when um, I, I did a plant training with some other folks who were actually from Seminole County and, and they had gotten this from one of their lakes. So you guys in Seminole County, you have some great um, aquatic plant folks um, who work for the county. So um, I don't know if anybody knows Gloria Eby, but a shout out to to her. And um, if you're looking for a field trip, you can you can hit her up locally. So this is uh, clearly, you know, you can see this plant is very different from the one I just showed. It it still has these opposite leaves, um, and uh, but it's got these huge teeth and much wider leaves. So you can see it's called the spiny water nymph. Oh, so so water nymph is the other um, is the other common name. So very spiny, um, and that is uh, Nias marina, which I I you know I would definitely say is is uncommon, but a pretty cool thing if you were to find it. So this is the this is the one that's considered um, threatened and and is tracked by. Um, FNA. So it's Nias filifolia. It has very fine leaves. So remember I said that Nias guadalupensis was at least one millimeter wide. Well, these leaves are less than a millimeter wide. Um, the, the leaves are often slightly recurved, which I'll show in, it'll be more obvious in other photos. Um, and they do have teeth. They do have small teeth on these leaves. And then the leaf also has this, um, this what's called an oracle, um, this little shoulder uh, type um, structure at the base that holds it to the to the stem, and then the fruit is prominently curved. So this fruit, having this curved fruit, is pretty much the defining characteristic for this species, um, because you know. If you've worked with plants, you know that sometimes the the size of the leaves or you know how many teeth it has, that can be variable. But this recurve fruit is is important. So here's a microscope photo of that fruit. Um, so I I first learned this plant. Um, this is another one that if I find it, I get really excited because um, you just don't find it very often. So I first learned this plant. Um, in the Tallahassee area, um, maybe 15 years ago or something, and and it was identified uh, to me by uh, someone who was who was a real great expert in our area. Um, 
at that time. And uh, so I felt very confident that that this was this was this, you know, elusive nice filifolia. So um, this curved fruit and you can see the teeth on the leaves. Um, so now when I see it in the field, um, this is kind of what it looks like. So we have here you can see the recurved leaves. So this is also in a panhandle site. Um, it's and, and I know it's kind of tough to tell with the different depths of the, the photo, but we've got these recurved leaves. You can see that they have teeth on them um, and the leaves are fairly thin. Um, so uh, this is what that same plant would look like out of the water. Um, so it does keep some form out of the water, but it's not a real strong uh, plant. But you can see the teeth. You can see how it's got some recurved nature to um, just the the way it's growing. So it's kind of got a like a little starburst sort of growth to it when you see it under the water. Um, this is uh, the kind of habitat it was found in. But sometimes, you know, it's really tricky. So here are some photos of um, individuals that I picked up at Lake Butler. Um, uh, more toward the center northern part of the state. And again, we've got got these teeth, got these small teeth, got these really skinny leaves. You can see the little oracle sheath. Um, but uh, there's even some recurving going on here. But look at this fruit. This fruit is not recurved. The fruit is just straight. So, you know, I see this plant and the leaves look exactly like this other specimen that was identified um, by this expert. And then I don't have these recurved fruits. Is that because this just isn't mature and I need to wait until later in the season until the fruits are mature? Or is this a different species? Could this be Nias minor, which um, if you if you look at the description of Nias minor in any of the references I can find, um, the description is pretty much identical to Philofolia, where they have these skinny, skinny leaves and it had, has these teeth, um, so except for that fruit. So I have to say this is a, uh, this plant is a little bit of a mystery um, because um, if you don't have those curved fruits, I don't know if that's uh, they're not mature or, or not. And I have also, I mean, I'm a nerd. I have gone to their barium. I have looked at their barium specimens. Um, that, that they have at FSU. And um, all of the plants that are called Nias minor in the herbarium uh, don't have fruits. None of them have fruits. And all the vegetation looks the same. So it's really tough. Here's another one. So you can see this real starburst appearance on this greener plant under here. Um, so the water's pretty silty. There's, you know, this is one of the reasons people don't like submersed. They're kind of dirty sometimes. But you see this starburst effect and you can tell these leaves have have teeth. Um, I was never able to to get this particular uh, population at, at this local site uh, with fruits. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it was it or not. Um, so that is my nice philofolia. And where is the nice minor uh, uh, saga? So we definitely have have philofolia, we probably have both. And, and the question is, how do you really tell them? And um, when is that fruit mature? So now I just want to show you a few, a few more of my favorites. Um, like I said, uh, uh, there's some plants that when I go out and if I see them, I just get really excited. So this is one of those. So the genus Iliochorus is actually the spike rushes. So most Iliochorus species are not submersed. Um, most of them are emergent, but uh, this is a submersed one that was um, in the in its own genus, uh, but now they've put it with the Iliochorus. But this is called algal bulrush, which is kind of a funny name, but it used to be called Websteria confervoides. So it has these long stems, these long stems, and then at the end, there are these series of, of whorls of, of branches. So they appear like puffballs in the water. Um, and you guys do have this plant in, in your area. This, I, um, I don't know if this photo was from the, the Ocala National Forest or, um, uh, or, or somewhere else, but it definitely occurs in, in that area. 
Um, and this is one of my favorites. It's an underwater photo where you can see um, how this appears when you're looking down in the water. Um, and, and this does tend to grow in really clear water. So you can see it um, and it's got this long stem and then these multiple little puff balls um, off the end. So it's just a pretty cool, pretty cool little plant. And this one, um, uh, you pretty much only are, are, you're more likely to find toward the end of the summer. Um, it, it, it can get abundant toward the end of the summer, but it's, um, uh, it doesn't tend to last through the winter. And I'd say the nice filifolia is the same. It'll kind of senesce at the, um, in the fall. Actually, you're more likely to find Nias filifolia fragments washing up in the beach of, of some kind of lake than actually go out in the lake and find it yourself. This is another uh, really sweet plant. So you guys are probably familiar with the common duck potato and um, other species of Sagittaria. So you're probably used to seeing big tall leaves of, of Sagittaria, like paddle shaped leaves um, with, with these three petaled white flowers. Um, but there are some, some smaller species uh, that grow um, either uh, like, this is kind of like a little tidal flat that, that these were growing on, um, or they might grow with submersed long leaves and then the little flowers will come up um, to the surface, but this is a, this is a sweet Sagittaria. Um, and then uh, this photo is um, actually fairly recent. This, um, if anyone who's familiar with Lake Jackson in Tallahassee, so it's one of our lakes that uh, drains every now and again through a sinkhole and, um, and we have a, a dried out lake. So that's what we have right now. So this is a very recent photo from there. And, um, these right now we have this beautiful yellow um, flowered meadow. Uh, so in this picture, these yellow flowers are Utricularia. So I think I saw um, in Mark's introduction, uh, uh, you've had a presentation about carnivorous plants. So Utricularias are carnivorous. They have little bladders that eat little um, insects. And um, the other thing in this photo is actually another spike rush species, um, another Iliochorus. So um, that one's called road grass and it makes this nice little carpet. Um, so yeah, anytime you see these sweet little yellow flowers, it's always kind of fun um, to investigate and see what is under them. So in this case, um, this is Utricularia gibba, which um, used to be called biflora because it has two little flowers on each stalk or um, two potential flowers there. You can see a divided, um, but now it's called Utricularia gibba. It is super, super common. And a lot of times you can see it as just a little string with, with bladders on it in the water or on a mud flat, or when the water is low like this, um, it will flower and it's super pretty. Um, this is a photo from one of my DEP colleagues who actually is, is in Orlando, Leif Bowman. And, um, he has this up on the, um, uh, Atlas of Vascular Plants, but this is a lake full of Utricularia floridana. So um, it has these yellow flowers that are emerging from the surface. And then you can, um, again, this, this is a plant that typically grows um, in very clear water and um, pretty much all Utricularias tend to be abundant. If you see them abundant, it's, it's usually a, um, a low nutrient condition. And, um, but they have, these have serious foxtails. So, um, you know, anytime you see a submersed plant and um, you can't quite tell what kind of branching structure it has, and you're like, oh, none of those branchings really match up with what she showed us, look for bladders. So if the, if the uh, stems and leaves um, have little bladders on them, um, and I don't have a large picture of a bladder for you, but uh, then, you know, it's probably a utricularia. They can have a lot of different, uh, there's some different branching styles. So that's Floridana. Um, here's another sweet utricularia that is um, not very common. So definitely get excited to see this one is utricularia radiata. It is one of the floating bladder warts. So this is the small floating bladder wart. Um, and actually in this photo, um, 
So this is the flower, of course, and then these little floats are not leaves, but they're part of the petiole, part of the flower stalk. And then underneath the water, you can actually see a few bladders. So you can see some of the branches and stems under the water, and these little roundish uh, structures are bladders. And if you've never done this, you should um, you should go to YouTube and um, type in utricularia um, bladder or 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 something. And there are some videos of um, little little tiny aquatic insects will come up to the there's little um, like little sensors on these bladders. And if the little insect touches it, the bladder sucks it right in. It's, it's pretty cool. So that's Utricularia radiata. And then this is another photo from that colleague Leif um, where he actually found both of these floating species, uh, floating flowered species um, blooming together. And you can see um, this is the radiata, which is the smaller of the two. And then this larger one is inflata. And, and there's various ways you can you can tell these species apart, but these are the two um, utricularia species that are um, aquatic and they most of their most of the plant is underwater. And it's only really during the early months of the summer that you can see these floating flowers. So um, they're they're pretty cool. And um, that will conclude uh, what I had for you tonight. Um, and I uh, leave you with a couple couple more cool photos. This is uh, Myaca fluviatilis. So this um, this is another world. Uh, it's world and simple, but this is called bog moss, um, and uh, is also a pretty cool one. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, and I'll close out of my presentation. Wow, thank you so much. Um, folks, this is a good time to pose your questions in the comment section. If you're watching us on YouTube, uh, comment us away in the live uh, chat. And the same thing for Facebook. Um, Rory actually asked a question very early on in the get-go. Rory, are, we're wondering if you're coming to the plant sale, so please let us know. Um, but his question is, what about batter dock? Um, you know, it seems like there is a love-hate relationship with it, herbicides ensue, uh, then the bottom gets shaded mm -hmm. out, hydrilla starts going nuts, um, rinse and repeat, he says. Uh, where can I find a recounting of natural history and the value of spatter dock? Thank you. Yeah, so um, I, I, Oh, I should have included it. I, I didn't include it. Um, that's not because it's not a good floating plant. So um, yeah, the spatter dock or cow lily is the genus Nufar. So um, there are a lot of, you know, it's one of those things people either lump or split, but Nufar, um, people either say it's one species or it's 20 different species. So I just call it Nufar. Um, and yes, it is um, it is a good native plant. Um, and for those who don't know it, it's the one that has the little bulb yellow flower. So it, the flower sticks up above the water. It's this little yellow bulb. Um, really pretty um, if you look at it once it's opened, but it's much less showy than the white. Um, the leaves, they, they often do grow together. Um, the leaves on the spatter dock have the rounded edge where the white water lily has that right angle that I showed you. Um, but it does have the the notch in the leaf, so it's much more similar in looking. So yeah, you know, I, I think I think aquatic plants and people who use waterways, um, there's sometimes a, a love hate relationship, and and I know that people who want to come through with motorboats, um, the plants can get in the way. Um, you know, FWC has has um, has a tough job of trying to keep keep the waters open for people in their boats and also, um, you know, certainly controlling e exotic plants. But um, I know there's a huge debate going on right now about herbicides versus, you know, maybe we should look into mechanical removal again. Um, but I agree when it comes to a beneficial native plant, which I, which I agree new far is um, it's, it's hard, it's hard to see them um, killed. So I, um, you know, I, I gotta say that I, um, 
I don't have a lot of real good resources off um, on hand about you know beneficial or not, um, but but I think um, you know we certainly consider Nufar to be a beneficial native, and yeah, usually they're just trying to keep the boat channels open if they if they spray that one. Very good. Uh, Sarah Chang is one of your fans. Uh, she's, she writes, thank you so much, and she appreciates you highlighting your trickle area. Um, Mac Camacho. Hey, Mac. Um, she wrote in a two-part comment on many of these ephemeral or uh, long-lived or colonizing. That was actually one of my questions, too, and I'd like to add on to what Mac is saying. Um, you had mentioned, uh, you know, some of them going into senescence. Were you uh, alluding that they were they were done for the season, like they're they're behaving like annuals or short-lived perennials, or um, will they regenerate from tubers uh, come springtime? Can you uh, kind of differentiate, uh, you know, which ones are annuals or short-lived perennials versus? Uh, I'm sorry, short-lived and, uh, yeah, yeah. short-lived perennials versus perennials. Yeah. Um, so most, uh, I, I'd say perennials um, dominate um, in the aquatic plant world, but some, um, so, so for instance, you know, uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't talk at all about grasses and sedges, but those, those hang on, they're perennials. Things like the Nufar and Nymphaea, all those floaters, um, they're really all perennials. They have, um, you've probably seen them certainly if, 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 uh, water levels went down, um, you know, they have these huge rhizomes that look like, um, I mean, it almost looks like the burnt, like a burnt cabbage palm stem or something under the water. There are these, these huge, uh, stems that the nymphaea has the, the white water lily, um, very much perennials. So some of the others, like the the nias species, are more of an annual. Um, the um, I I think you know a lot of the submersed, like the the kabamba, the uh, the fanwort, and then the coontail, the stratophyllum, you'll find those year round. Um, but the the nias and the websteria um, do tend to have more of a seasonal pattern, and I I sometimes wonder like you know, how much, if, if we had a more serious winter, would it, would it knock them back a little bit more? Um, because we definitely, you know, have, have places where these submerged plants can top out and, and you can have, you know, Camel Lake in the, in the Apalachicola National Forest here, pretty benign land use surrounding it, you know, about as pretty minimal in terms of human disturbance as we can get and nutrient inputs and, and that kind of thing those, uh, those submerged plants get topped out. It's crazy. And they're all native, um, but still a really vegetated situation. And I sometimes wonder, you know, if, if we need, um, you know, a cold summer to, to, to knock them back or, or some, I don't know, or if our dry cycles will help. But um, I will say that these plants do, they hang out a long time in, um, you know, in, in the sediment too, and can take advantage of, of conditions. Um, but I don't think of most of them as ephemeral, not, not, not in the way that you can have like a Good little, little flowering plant on land. Yeah. Good to know. Great question. Thank you, Mac. Uh, folks, if you have other questions, please go ahead and comment. Um, oh, and while I wait for other questions, um, about spiny water nymph, Nehas Mar uh, Marina. Mm -hmm. uh, when they say I've not I've not seen this plant in person. When they say spiny, are they just indicating the shape of the leaves, or are they saying that it is indeed spiny to the touch? Um, I think it's just it's just the shape. Although um, it so this is one I have not seen in 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 its habitat. I've I've only seen a, a piece of it brought, um, but. But yeah, it's not spiny like gonna hurt you kind of thing. It's just um, it's just got these large large teeth, um, and it might be a little crunchy because it grows in um, saltier situations. But great. And um, my last question. I think uh, we're wrapping things up here. So my last question is: um, right now in the news, uh, red tide is coming back up 
into uh, you know the muse's radar. Um, recently, just uh, as recent as this morning, I saw some sort of uh, news on the application of clay to combat red tide. Are you aware of uh, where this is going or is this a recent development that is being experimented at this point? Um, can you speak to that at all? Mm, probably not. So I haven't heard of red of, of clay being used for red tide. Um, I have heard of, of some experimental uh, treatments of uh, like cyanobacteria, blue green algae blooms um, using clay, um, but I don't know a whole lot about it. So couldn't, no couldn't, problem. couldn't recommend I, for or against it. Right. Thought I'd ask while I have mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you again, Nia. This concludes our program, our webinar for this month. Uh, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash couple of fern. I want to particularly thank Nia for her time. Uh, Ginny Steibold is here. Uh, she's a wonderfully mm -hmm. uh, wonderful member uh, mm -hmm. from Axia chapter in Jacksonville. Thank you, uh, Ginny. And uh, yeah, really appreciate your time, uh, Nia. And I'll and we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you so much for inviting me. And thanks everybody uh, for your for your attention. I appreciate it. All right, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.